Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for giving us the advantage of learning from you, learning from your word once again. Praise the Lord. So we're talking about uh, building the priesthood and the tabernacle. And um, like I said, I'm presuming that you're already initiated into this type of understanding. So you're not just hearing this for the first time. If you have to hear this for the first time, if you are just hearing this for the first time, then you have to go back to my, some of my previous teachings on Kebadulam, on the Kebadulam um, platform, on Facebook, or on uh, the Kebadulam uh, uh, platform on YouTube, and get some of my uh, initial teaching on this topic. Um, but I'm, I'm ready. This is a little higher than uh, those somebody who is just getting to know that Moses built a tabernacle and that the tabernacle, the tabernacle meant this and that. Hallelujah. Uh, okay, so we continue from where we stopped the other time. So we said, when God initiated the building of the tabernacle, um, he started from the holiest of all. And then he told Moses, build the ark, ark first. And he had the holiest of all. Um, specifications and then there was a veil and he, uh, he, he wove the veil um, through the uh, people that the Lord uh, inspired their skills and awakened their understanding of how to make all these things and then later they got into the holy place and the first thing you would see in the holy place it would be the, um, arc, the, the altar of incense and then you will see by your right hand side the menorah and by the left hand side, you will see the table of showbread, the pans and the spoons uh, that were used for the work of uh, the holy place. And then when you move out of, as you are uh, attempting to move out of the holy place, you would see, um, you will see the, another veil, uh, which rests, uh, which was hung upon five stands. And then you, that five, so to say, pillars holding the general curtain, you know, and then you, as soon as you come out, you come out into the outer court. Now, the outer court is not covered. Now, the holiest of all and the holy place, they were, they were covered. They were in a tent. But the outer court is, was not covered. And then as you move out of the holy place into the outer court, the first thing you will see will be the lava of water. And as you move forward, uh, the lava of water contained uh, liters of water that the priests would um, bath their feet or wash their feet from. And then from there, you move forward a little bit more, you will have the um, brazen altar or the altar of brass. The, on the altar of brass, that was where see, the sin offerings and the sacrifices were performed. And then when you moved past that place, you will see a very big opening, which is at the gate, and that, led, that will lead you out of the tabernacle. So we said, God started from the holiest of all, and then he moved to the holy place, and then he moved to the outer court. But if man were to journey, man would journey from where he is, from the outer court to the holy place and to the holiest of all. Now, there was a time Jesus was referring to the temple, the temple of Solomon, which Herod, had um, resurrected, uh, refurbished, you know, and renewed, restored. Actually, the, it was the first of all built by Solomon and then Zerubbabel uh, and Ezra, Haggai, in that generation when they returned from exile, they rebuilt and reconstructed the temple. And then it was destroyed again. And then Herod, who was the ruler at that time, built a very beautiful piece for the Jewish people. All right. And then Jesus pointed at that temple and he said, build, I mean, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Now, and then the priests, and then the, the priests, the Levites, the scribes, and the Jews were mad at him. They said, this temple took 46 years in preparation. That is to construct. Are you saying that you have power to destroy it and in three days you raise it? Then the writer of that um, uh, let, uh, that book of the scripture said, for they did not know that uh, he spoke of the temple of his body. The, so our bodies are temples. Did you get that? It was the temple of the living God. In fact, um, Paul said, uh, your bodies are the temple of the living God. So we know that from the testimony of, of, of uh, 
Jesus Christ and the testimony of Paul. We are temples. The Bible says uh, to uh, Peter, he said, we are being reconstructed. We're being constructed, edified as lively stones. We're being constructed together for a spiritual house which God would inhabit. So we know that the real picture in man's mind, in God, rather, sorry, in God's mind, for the building of the tabernacle was actually the building of man. A, re, a construction of man, the kind of man that God looked forward to, that he could tabernacle within. So, the tabernacle, the what out holiest of all, holy place, and how to call, we're speaking about mankind, that God wants to restore man, the three parts of man. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, he said, uh, that I pray that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul was sharing about that uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and in verse 23. Your whole, your complete, your total spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless. So if it's, the, if it's soul and spirit and there's no body, then it will not be total. It should not be complete. It will not be whole. If it were um, um, uh, uh, body and, and, and soul, it will not be complete. The three of them have to be there for it to be complete. So, man is a picture of God's temple. And we know that man has three major parts to him. Man has a spirit part, man has a soul part, man has a body part, and those, those three represent the tabernacle of God. Now, which of, which of the which, how do we locate it? How do we locate whether it's spirit, soul, or body that is there, uh, or which one is which, how do we locate that? Now, we locate them by finding out where God is resident. Where is God resident? In the real sense of you. God is resident in our spirit, in my spirit, in your spirit. I know you want to live in my body. He lives in my body. But the place of his exact residence is actually in my spirit. So, where he begins to reside. You know, eventually we take over the soul. Eventually we take over the body. But where it begins in its initial place of residence is what? Is the spirit. So we now conclude looking at the outer court, the holy place, and the holiest of all. We conclude that since God lives in the holiest of all, in the tabernacle of Moses, which was the, uh, the, base, the most basic uh, prototype of the dwelling place of God, of the tabernacle um, and the expression of the dwelling place of God throughout the Old Testament and uh, period and season. So we conclude that, therefore, if God dwells in my spirit, then the holiest of all must be the represent the spirit. So that's why in the New Testament, God started our salvation from our spirits. Our salvation didn't start from our bodies. Our salvation didn't start from our souls. Our salvation started from our spirits. Man is a spirit. We have a spirit. We, we, we are essentially spirit. Okay, can we go into a little bit of study? In um, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, the scripture says, uh, Let us, God said, Let us make man in our own image after our likeness and let him um, have dominion over, and, uh, over the, uh, the fowl of the air, the, you know, the beast of the earth, and all that. Now, the word for let us make man in our image, 126 there, it means uh, or speaks as uh, asa. That's the, the, the Hebrew word asa. Asa actually means to have a physical representation of to mold. That is what asa means. And then, so we have also, um, uh, then in Genesis chapter 1, verse 7, we say, so therefore, so God made man. In his image, after his likeness. That word made here is bara. Bara means to make without uh, the impute of any physical matter. There's no matter, there's no, um, you didn't use it, you didn't use wood, you didn't use stones, you didn't use mud. You just, you, there's a creation that is essentially spiritual. That is what um, bara is about. Now, we see that in Genesis 1, verse 26, the Lord has already barred, created man. In fact, the Bible says, male and female created he them. And um, uh, so, so the man, the spirit, had already been created 
uh, the spirit of man had been created and then the, uh, 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 so, so, so you see the man has already started existing even though he was not physically on the earth but he has started existing hallelujah now uh, but in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 we said told that God formed man of the dust of the earth now if you look at the word of there you would see that is in italics if you're using the King James version especially now so it means that that of was not initially there so if we remove the word of you will see that so god man so so god made man the dust of the ground so what god was forming in in genesis chapter 2 verse 7 was man the dust of the earth god was asa in the dust of the earth man the dust of the earth so the man, the man's body was brought to, uh, 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 into the physical in Genesis chapter two verse seven. And God breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and man became a living soul. I believe the spirit was put, injected inside man. You know, people that have died, they say they left their bodies and then they came back into the body. So the breath of life is the spirit that God put inside man, the spirit that God put inside man, and that is what jacked the body up. The body just jacked up, and then the awareness. The, the soul that God had already had a latent there that is waiting for the function of the spirit with the body, which will bring an awareness, which will bring consciousness, now came into being. You know, man was in the spirit before, and there was no, we didn't see any of his works, we didn't see consciousness. Even though he was in, in the spirit, he was conscious in the spirit, but as far as the earth was concerned, there was no consciousness of man in the, in, on the earth before that time. And then, so, but when the spirit entered, pam, into the body the soul came alive the soul of man came alive and the awareness the emotions and um, and all of that they all came alive the mind the will the emotion the intelligence uh, you know and all that consciousness uh, as long as the physical was concerned came alive at that point now so so we see that those three parts of man the the, the spirit the soul and the body uh, now, so the spirit was where God started our salvation from. The salvation experience started from the spirit. Now, because God recreated our spirit, Bible says we are new creations in Christ Jesus. You know, all things are passed away, and all things have become new. Our spirit has been reborn. He that is born of the spirit is spirit. You get that? So we're born of the spirit. So God, 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 God is saying that the one that has been born of the spirit is our spirit. Hallelujah. So, that, and so, so our spirit has been born by God. And that is the yeah, issue. Our spirits have been born of God. So because our spirit was born of God, um, therefore we say God started a walk from us, uh, from uh, our holiest that is our holiest that's where he lives god lives inside us in the holiest of all that's our spirit now if we strip my spirit how would you recognize my spirit yes i will recognize you recognize my spirit if you knew me in the physical because my spirit would be exactly like my body hallelujah maybe the glorious type of my body but when you see me you would really know me you would know me Hallelujah. So, so the, the, the spirit of man is exactly like the man. Now, how do I know that? Because um, when, when, the, 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 the G, when, when um, Peter uh, was being prayed for, uh, where they were making intercession for him, uh, for him to be released from Herod's um, uh, gulag, uh, when he had come, uh, in answer to prayer, and it was, he went to the place where the brethren were gathered together praying for him. He knocked and knocked, and then um, what, uh, there was a lady, Rhoda, went to the door to answer, to answer the door. And he said, Peter said, it's me. So she had to go and report to the, the, those who were uh, older than her. Well, Peter is outside, he's calling you know, and all. And maybe somebody had the keys or something in excitement. And he said, no, 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 it's not. Are you mad? It's not, it's not Peter. It's his, it's his angel. Now, what he meant was that it's his spirit. You know, because if, they, if you saw the spirit of Peter, you are going to know that, ah, this is, you are going to know that this is Peter. Praise God. So, if, so even though when we talk about my spirit, we, we put our hand to our bellies and, um, and then we, we talk about it, we balance my, but really we are the spirit. Hallelujah. We are the, but just that something, there is a, an us, the real us 
is deeper than this body and it is deeper than the consciousness of our minds. Hallelujah. It is deeper than that. Now, so, so because of that, we are, um, uh, uh, we, we can conclude that the, our spirit was where the good Lord started the work. Our spirit was reborn. The holiest was the first to be constructed. The mercy seat, you know, and then the, the box of the ark and with the angels looking uh, uh, into it, they, they were the first to be constructed. And that's the holy, that's, that's, that's the, 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 the best of God, you know, that God could, you know, started with us. He has, he has done most of the work for us. Praise God. And then uh, when you move into the holy place, the first thing you see is, um, uh, is the altar of incense by, uh, and that center there, um, a bit away from the, um, uh, bread, table of incense and the, um, and the menorah. Teb the menorah was, uh, in the, uh, uh, at the right hand side. The table of incense was, uh, uh, uh facing the menorah. And then, <clears throat> and then the, uh, the, the, arc, the, the altar of incense was in front of them to this side. So if you're coming from the holiest of all, after the veil, you entered in, saw the, um, altar of incense and you see the menorah there and you see the, table of the showbread here now what would that place mean that place will talk about our soul because really looking at it the 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 the, the showbread which are 12 you look at um, 12 the things that are 12 through our scripture can just so that we can just find it. so we'll just say unilaterally this means this this means that so let's look at what what are we see, what can we see in scripture there are twelve. You know that there are twelve hours of the day, twelve hours of the night. How do you know that twelve hours of the day, twelve hours of the night? Is it because our clock shows it? No. Because the Lord said, Are there not twelve hours in the day? The Lord said that. Praise <laughs> God. So we 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 walk, we understand these things based on the authority of scripture. We're not just saying this means that, that means this. Mm -mm. Lord say, are there not twelve hours in the day? So we know that twelve hours in the day. And in the day. and since the the day and the night are equal in hours. So we know that there should be 12 hours in the night. Praise God. So we have 12 hours of the day, and then we have 12 hours of the night. So what are the 12 hours of the day about? What are the 12 hours of the night about? What makes the day day? What makes the night night? What makes the day day? Because the sun is in governance. Did you get that? <laughs> so so, so God, it, it, the sun governs is what makes the day day because it shines a light. Hallelujah. So we know, we therefore conclude that 12 is the number of governance. Praise God. Because the Son represents the Lord. Hallelujah. The Son sometimes is used to talk about the Lord. So uh, it, the Son governs the day and then the moon governs the night, reflecting the light of the Son uh, and then beaming it to the, to the earth. But we know that the light of the night is not as strong as the light of the day. And that's why the night is night and day. day. So we say 12 is the number of, of governance. Also, because we have, um, okay, if I may go a little bit extra biblical, we have the 12 constellations. The constellations are to uh, which the, the, our, our own planet and sun move into past season. Now, the 12 constellations, are, they, they bring forth the ordinance of heaven part time. They bring forth the ordinance of heaven part time. When we're trying to look at what the showbread means because we're in the holy place and what it means to us because it is not just about knowledge it must be something that is workable so we're looking at the constellation the constellations are 12 what are constellations stella the word stella actually means star so when you have constellations constellations so that means a group of stars so when you look at the heavens in the night you see scattered stars but really the stars are in group and the Asians group them into 12. And then they say that this, our sun goes in there. And that is the truth. Our sun moves around that. And then there are virtues that are that each season of its movement into each constellation are portend to the nations, to the earth, to humanity, and to the universe entirely. Uh, uh, um, just like in Nigeria, when the May, when we are in the month of May and June, what does that speak of? It speaks of Waek. So that's when children do their Waek from school. You know, uh, just like anytime it's October, I am reminded of when I'm born. So we have these 12. 
and they, they portend some certain things to the earth and to humanity and to the entire universe. Now, they're trying to decode what number 12 means. Now, uh, and then, uh, like I've always said, if you have listened to some of my teachings before, you will know that these were the things that um, Abraham's parents, grand grandfathers, great 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 grandfathers, those are the things they were looking into to determine what would come to the earth. Now, we said during the last year that Abraham was born from all of the Chaldeans, and then we know that they were only looking at the stars to know what was going to come to pass in the earth and all that. We're still looking at what 12 means, because we don't just say, this means this and all that, because there are 12 showbread in that place. Now, we also know that the children of Abraham were called, and were 12 in number. The tribes were 12 in number. Hallelujah. The tribes, the tribes were 12 in number. And then they were told that the fathers of the tribes, which, which, whose names were actually given to the tribes. They were told, so they are like leaders, rulers, governors. And then we also have um, uh, the gates of Jerusalem, which are 12. Gates are authorities. Gates means authorities. Okay? Because if you cannot access the gate into this facility where I'm speaking from, it is very, very possible that you'll not be able to gain access into this place. If the gate doesn't open for you, you can get access. Access. So gates are types of governors. Hallelujah. So they are governmental. Twelve is a governmental number. Is a number of the government of God. Now, um, we also have, um, and for you to know that the, the gates are the twelve number of the gates are significant, or where significant, are sixteen significant. Now, uh, when is, when when Jerusalem was built, it had twelve gates. But even after Jerusalem had been destroyed, the twelve gate had to be restored. Because if the, 12, if the 12 gates, if the number 12 didn't mean anything much, then when they were going to restore the gates of Jerusalem, it would just have been, you know, um, they would just have put two there, or put one there, or put three there, instead of allowing the entire 12 to continue uh, uh, being there. And then we have, um, we have so many other things that are related to it. Uh, you know, uh, to the number 12. Um, we talk about the disciples of the Lord. The Lord um, had 12 disciples, you know, and if 12 was not significant, we just have made three, maybe Clark, James, John, and Peter, um, and they say, okay, you guys, I think you can do the work. You are the one that have my heart the most, and all that. And then, we could have gotten 500. We could have even gotten the 70 to do the work. And say, okay, you guys are good. Enough for this, you'll you be able to get all over the world. But you know, he chose 12. Why? Because the 12, number 12 is significant. So, 12 is significance of governance. So, coming to the. Now, we could even talk about the gates of the city of God in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. They are 12 in number. Now, that is, those are the things that are um, the qualities of God by which we have access into kingdom. You know, kingdom is not being born again. That's just the beginning of kingdom. When we talk about this kingdom, people, a lot of people think, ah, I'm already in the kingdom. But kingdom actually means God governing and ruling your life. And it doesn't mean that God give, providing for you alone. It also means that you working in line with God. Now, there are two parts of the church that, that misunderstand this. The ones that are focused on obeying God and doing the will of God say, okay, I am in the kingdom, even though I am sick, even though I am uh, poor, even though I am hounded by my enemies, I'm in the kingdom. That is not a good expression of kingdom. Praise God. You have to have your needs met. Praise God. You cannot be hounded everywhere by your enemy every time, you know, without any victory. Hallelujah. So, kingdom means if God was the one ruling, how will our life be? So, there are 12 access, 12 gates. We call it gates, but they are actually access authorizations that uh, that authorize us to experience kingdom life that's why i said blessed is he is he who obeys his commandment that he may have access through the gates into the city did you get that so when we do his will it gives us authorizes us to have access through the gates into the city Praise the name of the Lord. So that's the way this works. That's the way it works. Now, so there are 12 gates of the city. So there are 12 showbread. He said the bread, the bread actually originally in the, 
uh, in the Old Testament, uh, in, at the construction of the tabernacle, at the inception, they were the bread, the, the food of the priests. It must be fresh daily. So who are the priests? We are the priests. We are a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people. Uh, so, uh, 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 I believe that we'll be able to talk more about the priests in the series as the series goes on later. But we're focusing more on a lot on the tabernacle arrangement right now. Uh, so each of this gay of this showbread, they, are, they represent gates. They represent authorization that gives you the uh, the right to to be under divine government. For example, if we're going to uh, wanted to become a Canadian citizen and American citizen, like in Africa, everybody wants to be. Most of the people that are not well off see America, Canada, Australia, the UK, uh, and other Western nations as uh, uh, a place where they can just make a headway, you know. So, but they have to go to the visa office. It is a visa office that gives you that pride, that passage to be an American citizen or a Canadian citizen or an Australian citizen, citizen or a New Zealander or, you know, so it's, it's the visa office. So those gates are like visa offices. For example, let's just give an example, an example, healing and health. I want authorization to partake of healing and, and life and health. Then I must go through that revelation that gives me that authorization. Praise God. There is a revelation that gives you authorization. Many years ago in those days, Reverend Higgins taught about healing, health, life. Rev. E.W. Kenyon spoke about that. If you didn't partake of that, you cannot enter. Did you get that? So just you know, we're not saying there's a gate called the gate of healing. No. I'm not saying that. I'm not uh, implying that, but we're giving an example of how these things work. Now, so the Holy Place, you say it is our soul. It represents our soul. Because that's the place of governance. Let me give you another example about why your soul is your ultimate place or your secondary place of governance, but which impacts on your living here. Just imagine a sick person. There's a sick person in the hospital, and that sick person is in coma. His spirit is there. His body is fresh, but he cannot see. He cannot taste. He cannot hear. He can't do any of those things. Why? Because he is... Um, how do you say it now? Because he's unconscious. He's unaware of his environment. You know? So the spirit of a man can be there. His spirit is there in him. His body is fresh. But if his mind is unaware of his environment, then he's said to be unconscious. So if he's unconscious, that means the, the governance of the soul... He is not allowed to walk. So he's a vegetable. They call those kinds of people vegetables. You know, they can't they can't they can't walk. They can't do the normal thing because they don't have the full use of their souls. Their emotions they may hear, but they cannot really respond and all that. So our souls are very important. It doesn't matter how much of a child of God you are. If your soul, if the, the if the enemy is ruling in your soul, you are not going to bring forth the fruit of a child of God. Plain. Just simple. So that's why sometimes we have, um, we can, it's possible to have a child of God, a, a, you know, a son of God in the spirit. is a child of God. is a person of God and all that. But in the soul is at enmity with God. His soul is at enmity with God. So therefore, he cannot bring forth the, uh, the governance of God. God's governing uh, 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 the, the nature of God can comfort. Uh, the power of God cannot comfort. The grace of God cannot comfort. Why? Because the reason is because his soul is not in compliance with the rule of God. So, um, so his spirit is born, has been worked on, but if God's working does not continue in his soul, then his soul is at abeyance to God. You know, it's not working. So you can be a child of God and live like a child. You can be a child of God in the spirit and live like a child of the devil on the outside. It, it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't, you know, it just, it just lives like a child of the devil on the outside. It doesn't live like a child of God, even though really it's a child of God. So, so sometimes it's possible that we have seen certain believers who were 
children of God. We, are, we know they, were God, they got born again, but we can see certain weaknesses in their lives that will not make them to live like God wants them to live. So in the next episode on the seri- in the series, we will talk about, we will continue to talk about uh, God's working as it relates to his progression towards us from the holiest to the holy place and then eventually to the outer court. God bless you.